Morning, everybody. It is 9.30. Time to get our class going. Welcome to all of you who are here. Welcome to everybody online. We're studying the book of Acts or the, the practices of the apostles. Last week we covered chapter 1. I'm going to jump right into chapter 2. And I don't know if you've ever thought about Acts chapter 2. This is... I hesitate to say this is the most important chapter in the Bible, but this is absolutely a focal point. The kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world is established in this chapter. Everything that Jesus came to do, he did, and its fruit is found here as the church begins in the second chapter of Acts. So let's do some reading. We'll read through, hopefully this morning we'll get through the whole chapter, but just to start us, we'll read through the first three sections. The first section of chapter 2 is 1 through 4, so I need a reader for 1 through 4. All right, Larry's got that, and then let me pick up the picture. We're having printer problems at home, so what I did was I took a picture of the page I typed up, and I'm looking at the picture, if I can, where are you? Oh, that's not it. It is. Aha, I think that's it. Yeah. 5 through 13. We'll take 5 through 13. Need a reader for that. All right, DW. And then uh, the next section is 14 to 21. Janie. Janie's got it. All right, let's do some reading. Let's pick up the first part of the, the, uh, the book of Acts and move right on. Larry? When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was given them utterance. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, not very Jews, from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Benamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judah, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, uh, Phygia, and Pamphylia, uh, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Serene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let us come down to you and give ear to our words. For these people are not the ones, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last day it shall be that I will pour out my spirit on all of that. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall drink drink, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens and earth and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon to blood. The day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank you all. Appreciate your reading. Uh, we should applaud D.W. He had the uh, all those different pronunciations to, to go, and he, he made it through there just fine. All right. 
The first four verses tell us about the baptism of the Holy Spirit that came on the apostles. And there is some controversy over whether or not it's the apostles or the 120. Because when you go back into the first part of, well, chapter 1, it says there were about 120 of them in verse 15. And those got together and they selected uh, Matthias as the apostle. That's the ending of chapter 1. And then it says in the last verse, of chapter 1, they drew lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the 11 apostles. How the lots were drawn? Yes. No. There, there's no way to know that for sure. We just know some ideas from culture, from secular information, but we don't really know how that did. But uh, the point is that however the lots were done, God was the one who made the choice. Now, Remember, there's no chapters and verse divisions in the original, so it's like Luke just goes right on in. They, that's the 11 apostles, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one place. So that's talking about the apostles, I believe, and by English rules, that's the way it's supposed to be, the previous antecedent. You've got the, the pronoun they, which refers to whoever was previously referred to, and the ones previously referred to were the apostles rather than 120. And then the Holy Spirit comes on these guys. And what you see throughout the rest, not only of the second chapter, but the book of Acts, is the focus being on the apostles as the ones who received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, it is true, uh, Joel prophesies that God would pour out his Holy Spirit on whom? On his manservants and his female servants and that is fulfilled at least uh, in chapter 21 when we see a man by the name of Philip we're introduced to him in chapter 6 by the way but we meet Philip in chapter 6 and later on in chapter 21 we find out he's got four daughters and what are they doing they're prophesying and you don't prophesy without the Lord's intervention so the Lord was giving them the ability to prophesy and so God was pouring his spirit out on men and women. But the focus in chapter 2 and throughout the rest of Acts is on the apostles. And there's a, let me give you a few things on that just so uh, you'll have it. I'll get that picture back up. Look at my note. I've never seen anything like this new phone. You, you got a little dot grid and you instead of putting your finger and thumb on there you you do the gut make your mark on there and it opens the phone up anyway you don't need to know that do you now we haven't talked about pentecost but pentecost you can read about that in the 23rd chapter of leviticus and what god says is you you take the uh the passover feast and you count seven sabbaths so how many days is seven sabbaths that's 49. And then on the next day, so that would be day 50, and it, it would be the first day of a week because the Sabbath is Saturday. 49 Sabbaths is, that's the last Saturday is number 49, and then day 48 is, or day, day, day 50. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I need help with my math there. That's the first day. And so this would have been the first day of the week. And we look at those feasts sometimes and we think, oh, there wasn't much purpose to those feasts. It was just a time for the, apostles, or the, uh, the Jews to get together in Jerusalem. But there was more than that. And, and this, the, the, the Passover, the Pentecost, all of that foreshadowed the establishment of the kingdom. Uh, let's see. In chapter 2 and verse 7, when, when the crowd is talking about those who are doing those things that are miraculous. They're talking about them being Galileans. So we know the apostles were Galileans, but we don't. it wouldn't be likely that the 120, all of those were Galileans as well. And then in verse 14, Peter stands up. Who's he stand up with? Stands up with the 11. He doesn't stand up with the 119. He stands up with the 11. And then in chapter 2, verses 42 to 43, it says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, not the teaching of the 120, but the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through whom? 
through the apostles. So the focus is on the apostles. If God did anything with the others who were of those 120, he's not telling us about it, and he may have. But the focus that the Holy Spirit gives us through Luke is the apostles. And then again in chapter 8, we're looking at the apostles. They were the ones through whom the Holy Spirit could be given by the laying on of hands. But if you'll notice in chapter 8, Philip is there. This is, this is not Philip the apostle. This is Philip the evangelist in chapter 8. And he's doing wonders and signs. What I believe is happening is the apostles have laid their hands on Philip. And by them laying their hands on him, he's able to do wonders and signs. And when the, the apostles heard about it, they sent Peter and John. This is uh, chapter 8. Where are we here? Verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. If Philip had the baptism of the Spirit, he could have done that. But it's not apparent in the text that he did. They seem to be sending Peter and John specifically for that. So Philip was not an apostle and was not given the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but he did receive the laying on of hands apparently from the apostles so that he could do the miraculous. Those are just a few things uh, to, to keep in mind when we're looking at who received the Holy Spirit and who did not. Uh, baptism wise first verse of chapter 2 where it says they were gathered all in one place that doesn't say that they were gathered in one place with 120 right. they could have been gathered in a different place right. Matthias was chosen he was numbered among the apostles and they it says in chapter 2 what we now know is chapter 2 were together in one place so that, that reasoning through the language makes it appear that it was just the apostles. And these other things certainly focus on the apostles. So if you ever run into anybody who wants to say, well, I think it was 120, you'll have this to help them see, well, that's, that's not the picture that Luke is giving us. All right. Yes. Oh, whether it was a miracle of the, the apostles speaking or whether it was a miracle of the people's ears hearing. And it was definitely, in, in my estimation, a miracle of the apostles speaking. The Holy Spirit was poured out on them, and they spoke. So these other guys, uh, <clears throat> and it's interesting how Luke puts it. There apparently was, was a, a spokesman, or, or this was just such a general question that they had in verse 8 somebody is asking how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born so the spirit is poured out on the apostles it's not poured out on the whole crowd so the miracle is with them they are speaking in tongues and they're speaking so well that everybody there from all these different 15 nations mentioned are hearing the apostles speak in their language. And where are these apostles from? Galilee. Don't mention any names, but you find a county in Oklahoma that you think is the most, no, the least likely to put anybody forth who's going to be notable, and, and that would be Galilee. That's why they were, so, these aren't these guys Galileans, they're from way up there in the sticks. Uh, and we're hearing them speak in our own language. How do they know these languages? Wouldn't you love to be able to speak another language fluently? If you can, wow, that's a great ability. Don? People try to say that the, uh, <clears throat> that the miracle was also in the hearing of the, of the believers. <laughs> they point to verse 13. Some of them were mocking them, saying they were drunk. But you can kind of look at that as that in verse 14 it says Peter took a stand and raised his voice above the others. So apparently they were all speaking to their particular groups in tongues. And if somebody was just passing by and they didn't really care about the message and they were just thinking, you know, this is all silly stuff anyway. You know, they might have thought they heard them all 
all at once. They, they could have actually tried. Their deals got in their trunk, you know. Not, so it, I don't believe it was necessarily in the, it wasn't in the hearing. It wasn't the speaking like you say. But some will argue because of verse 13 was the point. Okay, good point. It's good to know that. Raise his voice, so it looks like they were all speaking at the same time at some point to their individual groups. And you can imagine, because this, this wasn't a time when you had a, a podium and individual speakers would get up there. People are, are talking, and of course you leave room for God's provision. One of these guys would start preaching the gospel, and, and you're gathered in Pentecost. This is, this is a holy day. You're gathered in Jerusalem at Pentecost. You're in the holy city for a holy uh, feast, and someone stands up, and in your language, fluently and articulately says, the Messiah has come. That's basically the message that these guys are giving. We're not told everything that they say. What we're told is what Peter preaches when there is this commotion. And who knows what the other guys are saying. However, since the crowd is saying, we're hearing them speak in our own languages, they must have been saying something. So there's 12 apostles. And they have all received the baptism of the Holy Spirit for the purpose of displaying the works of God and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so this is what's happening in Jerusalem. And we don't have the specifics on exactly how this came out. But there was enough of a commotion that Peter stood up with the 11. And he got the, the attention of the crowd and he began to, to speak. And what was it? Oh, Don? It's just an opinion. I'm just trying to figure this out. When Peter decided to raise his voice, it very well may be that he decided to start speaking in Greek at that point. So everybody could understand. You know, they knew several, you know, they might know both languages, but Greek was the worldwide. And then typically people knew their language in their own area. So I, I, when I look at it, I'm thinking, well, I guess when Peter raised his voice and began to preach this and all the way down to Acts 2, he might have been decided, well, now I'm going to speak in Greek so everybody can understand, you know, rather than one particular dialect or one language. It could well be. And there's all kinds of things we could, we could wonder about. But the fact of the matter is, this being the focal point of the establishment of God's kingdom, you know, God was there. He, he gave the apostles the Holy Spirit. And Providence, I'm sure, was working as well so that Peter would be able to stand and speak to such a large crowd and be heard with all of the apparent commotion that must have been going on. As you can imagine, you, you've come, 15 different nations are represented here, though they're all Jewish, and somebody is saying the Messiah has come. What, what's this all about? And Peter stands up, and he becomes the focal point. So, what does Peter say? What does he start with? Don't look at me. It's not on me. It's in your book. You got a book? Okay. Right, there came from heaven. And now, that was with the apostles. But then when Peter finally stands up, I say finally, eventually stands up, verse 14, what does he say at this point? What's that? Okay. And all right. What? Whenever John baptized Jesus, and of course Jesus said, "Suffer to be so, fulfill all righteousness." And then God says, this is my beloved son and whom I'm well pleased to hear ye him. And then this instance where God poured out his spirit and, and he says, listen to me. So there's instances, both places where God is very present. Think about that idea that God has poured out his spirit. And why didn't he do it some other way? Why didn't he just miraculously put in the minds of everybody there, boom, oh, somehow I know about Jesus. Somehow I know that the Messiah has come. Somehow I know that salvation is available to me. Why did God not do it? Well, he, he doesn't work like that. Who's he work through? 
He, he works through the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes to men, and these men are doing what? They are preaching the gospel. That's what Peter does as, as he begins to give them this prophecy of Joel. Preston? Uh, the statement that you said doesn't work like that, whenever I think about whenever they were building the temple, God gave them the mind to be able to build the, like the, the, the metal works and whatever. Right. You mean the tabernacle? The tabernacle, yeah. Right. I'm sorry. Then, then Solomon, God gave him wisdom. So, I mean, he does do that, but there's a certain way he does it. So. Right. Uh, he doesn't do it with regard to the gospel, is what I'm saying. I didn't mean to, because you go back to Adam when God made Adam. Uh, I'm sure 10 seconds after Adam came to, he was able to speak and walk and all the things that God just put that in him. Uh, Harold, is that your hand or was it Billy's? Oh, it's Billy's. Billy's right behind you, Harold. John, six, John 16, 13 through 15 there, he's saying, but when the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you in all truth. And what's the truth he's calling to guide you in? That Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Right. And, and that's, that's what Jesus he, told him in, in John chapter 14 and 16, basically tells him the same thing, that the Holy Spirit's coming. He's going to give you comfort. He's going to tell you things that, that I've, he's going to remind you of things I've told you. He's going to guide you into all truth. And that's what's beginning here in Acts chapter 2. I thought I saw another hand somewhere. Harold? It was you this time. Oh, well, anyhow, what I think when I read through this, it seems to me this is God's plan that he had all along. And what he's letting the apostles do becomes an example of what we're going to try to do individually <coughs> as we go through the church through the years that comes. God could come to today to speak from a pulpit to encourage people. But he's given us a method by which man can do that. Guided by the Holy Spirit, guided by the Word. We can do that, and we can try to learn what he wants us to do. And God doesn't have to come and visit us with every time he wants us to know something. And he could have done that there in Acts chapter 2, but he didn't choose to do it that way. That wasn't his plan. Right. And when, when Peter reveals to them that what's happening is the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, well, do they know anything about Joel? Well, of course they do. How did they know that? That wasn't miraculous. They, they know these things, and God is using these truths that he's given his people throughout the centuries to, to draw on draw the focus on this truth that's taking place. This is the greatest fulfillment of, of all the plan of God. This death, burial, and resurrection, and, and here is the fruit of that death, burial, and resurrection taking place on Pentecost. Remember, Jesus has been ascended now for about 40 days. The Feast of Pentecost has fully come. Jesus, uh, the, the night that he established the Lord's Supper. What night was that? That was what feast? That was Passover. They were eating the fat Passover feast, and so this is 50 days after all that has taken place. Yes. So, yes. So we've got, got that uh, background that helps us focus on what's happening here in the second chapter. Don? God miraculously coming to us and giving us the answers in our brains or whatever. I mean, it's pretty clear that he uses people to spread the gospel. He, didn't, he chose to do it that way. And Romans 10, 14 says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Right. So the whole point is, is he's using people that have believed to preach. He's told us to go out and do that. So that's how, he, how he's working today. And is that, a, is that a quote from the 10th chapter? I was thinking that was a quote from Isaiah. Is that right? Oh, well, I'm just saying, if it was a quote from Isaiah, Isaiah was a prophet. He spoke through the Holy Spirit for sure. Uh, and, and he's saying, you need a preacher. You've got to send out preachers. And that's what's happening in the book of Acts. 
who are being introduced to the apostles as the messengers of Jesus, the ones that he hand-selected, but we're also seeing others who are preaching the gospel. Can you name some of those others who are preaching the gospel who were not apostles? Stephen was one. What happened to Stephen for preaching the gospel? They, they put him to death. They stoned him to death. Who else preached the gospel who was not an apostle in the book of Acts? John, John the Baptist was prior to this, but, but he was definitely a preacher of the gospel. In Acts, how about Philip? We mentioned Philip earlier. Uh, how about Priscilla and Aquila? A couple of people who, who did they help to know the way of the Lord more perfectly? I know we're going a little farther into Acts than we've already come. Oh. Apollos. They, so there were other people that the Holy Spirit is having Luke to point out who preached the gospel and carried the message, men and women. That's when, when Jesus was resurrected, who really brought the news to the apostles? Who was the one? It was Mary. Mary brought the news to the apostles, and they didn't believe her. What? what do you mean he's resurrected? See, when I read that stuff, it's like, okay, there's, the, there's hope for me. <laughs> Because Jesus had told these guys over and over, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to be put to death and resurrected on the third day. And not a one of them were there at the tomb waiting on the third day for Jesus to come out. Not a one of them. And when Mary did see the resurrected Christ and take the message back to the apostles, they said, you're crazy. Essentially, that's, that's foolishness. But now, they've been with the risen Christ, and what are they doing on Pentecost? They're preaching that Jesus has resurrected. That's their conviction because they know it to be true. These guys are the witnesses, as Jesus said. Where would they be witnesses? Starting in Jerusalem, as Isaiah and Micah had said, and then Samaria, or Judea and Samaria, and, and then Oklahoma. It, that's, that's the way it goes. Preston? One, one it talks about where God's starting with Hebrews and he said God who at various times and in various ways spoken past to our fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son he kind of surmises that talks about Jesus and how he's uh, been taken to the right hand of God but it's almost kind of like a restatement of what was said in, 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 in a manner and I'm not saying exactly in a manner of what happened on the day of Pentecost he just it's almost like they take this and they retell the story, and every time they retell it, it gets just a little deeper meaning and a little clearer. You know what I'm saying? But yes. that, that very first part of Hebrews, I was reading that and was thinking, that's similar to what we're talking about here when the, when the God poured out the Spirit. You know, it's just being kind of focused on Jesus and almost like this is my beloved son, here you him type thing. You know, it just that's what keeps coming back to my mind. I don't know about you guys as parents and grandparents, but if there's something we wanted our children to get, we kept repeating it over and over and over and over until your kids would finally say, oh, we know, we know, we know, no, we know. Yeah, well, they would respond like that because they've heard it so much, and, and that's what God has to do with us. Just what we were talking about a minute ago, the Mark records, and that doesn't mean, I think there were more times than this, Mark records nine different times Jesus told the apostles about his death, his coming death. And they, they still didn't get it. They didn't believe it. And even when Acts starts, we didn't spend much time on this. What was their question in Acts chapter 1? Is this when you're going to restore the kingdom? They still didn't really understand what the kingdom was all about. But when the Holy Spirit came on them in Acts chapter 2, it was like the lights came on. Oh. Oh, this is it. This is what it's all about. And that was the preaching from there on out. We, we do so much. We want things to be physical. We love that. We love the trappings. We love the things we can get our hands on that we can see with our eyes, things we can hear with our ears. But the kingdom is not physical. The kingdom is spiritual, and it comes to us through the truth of God's word. God is writing his laws on our hearts, and it's just not a physical thing. That's what the apostles were hoping for. I think that's what all of Israel was hoping for. 
come and set up a kingdom and drive these Romans out and make Israel a great nation once again. And God says, that is not my plan. I got a much better, much bigger, uh, much more eternally minded plan than that. And so when, when we see the teachings of those who say God's going to come back and he's going to set up a kingdom in Jerusalem and he's going to reign from his throne here on the earth. It's like, really? There, he's got heaven. He's got eternity. And he wants to bring his kingdom down here. When Jesus was talking about taking oaths, what did he refer to the earth as? His footstool. Why would the king of kings and lord of lords come sit on his footstool to reign? It, it doesn't make sense. All that idea is a misinterpretation of statements that are in the Bible. But there is no, no such uh, kingdom to be established from Jerusalem. The kingdom of heaven is being established in Jerusalem right here. And that's what Isaiah and Micah were talking about, that the law of the Lord would go forth from Jerusalem. Don? Premillennialism, pre correct? Yes. He's not come to... To have somebody tear down the present mosque in Jerusalem, build a new temple, right. and him go reign there with all the nations for a literal 1,000 years. You're right. saying he's not trying to establish that kingdom anymore. It's already been established. It's the church. Yes. And this, this kingdom is unshakable. That's, what, that's how the Hebrew writer talks about it. It's not something that you can bomb in Jerusalem. Uh, and I know I saw a commercial uh, just a couple days ago. And it was talking about uh, the earthquakes that are taking place and the war in Ukraine and nuclear bombs and all. This is all fulfillment of prophecy. And I'm thinking, no, I, I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I remember reading a, a book called Late Great Planet Earth. Anybody read that book? You remember? It's, you got to be old. A fellow by the name of Hal Lindsey back in the 70s, he made a wrote this book about how the Lord was going to come back in 1988 and that the, uh, the Chinese were going to attack coming across the Euphrates River, except there wouldn't be a river because nuclear war would have dried it up, and so they'd all be drinking Coca-Cola because there wasn't any water. Now, that, that's, I know, I know, but that's the kind of stuff that, that you read when the, the Word of God is, is misinterpreted and guys want to want to lace something on that that's not the way it's supposed to be. <clears throat> Without the guidance of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, that might be what the apostles would have preached because they were asking about that kind of a kingdom in chapter 1. And so God says, all right, I'm going to fulfill this prophecy in chapter 2. I'm going to pour out my spirit. And so you'll be able to teach the truth just like Jesus had said in John 14 and 16. I'm going to send my spirit. He's going to lead you into all truth. And, and blessed are those, he said, who believe in me because of your word. That was John chapter 20. So this is, this is the fulfillment of this all taking place. Joel's prophecy, a, a ton of prophecy is, is coming about right now. Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, those two great dreams, one by Nebuchadnezzar and one by Daniel about the four kingdoms and the kingdom of God being established in the days of that final kingdom. And this is, Rome is the final kingdom, and God's kingdom is being established right here in the days of Rome. And it's going to incorporate all kingdoms. And that's what the church has done. The church has gone everywhere on the planet, and no matter where you're from, what language you speak, what nation you're from, what your ethnic background is, you people are incorporated into the kingdom. And that's why when we read the Revelation, you read about the 144,000, which is a, a figurative number to say that every, everybody who's supposed to be included is included. But then John gives us a vision, or Jesus gives John the vision, John writes this down for us, of, of a, a multitude. How does he describe that multitude? Without number from every nation under heaven. That's, that's what we're seeing begin right here in Acts chapter 2. The gospel's going out to every nation under heaven and there's going to be a multitude of people in eternity who are our brothers and sisters because of this gospel going forth right here. All right. Yeah, have I made that clear as mud? Uh, 
Apparently so. So <laughs> let's just move on. Chapter, uh, let's read verses 22 through, uh, oh, what are we going to, 22 down through 36. Who's, who's, that's a long one. Let's split that up. 22 to 28. Who's got that? Who wants to read 22 to 28? Now we've got you scared. Nobody wants to read. Okay, Ron's going to read that. And then we'll read 29 down through 36. Who's got that? All kinds of literate people in here now. Yes, chapter, chapter 2. Then, uh, Harold, you'll be 28 through, 20, through 36. All right, Ron, verse 22. You'll hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, and I may not be shaken. Therefore my God rejoiced, and my son was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. <coughs> Here will be Brethren, I may confidently say to you, regarding uh, our patriarch David, that he would both die and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that uh, God had sworn to him with an oath to seek one of his descendants upon his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned in Hades, nor did he suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up, to whom we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth that which you see and hear. For it, is, it was not David who descended, ascended into heaven, uh, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you have crucified. Thank you, guys. Peter stands up first in verse 14, and he gives them the prophecy of Joel. That's so he can explain what they are doing speaking in tongues. This miraculous manifestation of speaking these foreign languages that these guys didn't know before. Peter's explaining that in 14 through 21. And then once he gets that explained, where does he begin? He begins with Jesus Christ. And does he soft soap it? That's an old phrase. Maybe some of you don't know what soft soap means, but that means you, you kind of go easy. Look what he says. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs. What does that mean? That means God proved to you who he was by the miracles, wonders, and signs. There was no doubt that he was who he was because God backed him up with miracles, wonders, and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, as you know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Now there in verse 23, <clears throat> you see the providential working out of God's plan, but it's not just God who's at work. Who else is at work? Men are at work in their evil, and God uses their evil. He uses their ignorance. He uses their arrogance. Everything that the Pharisees were that was against God God used that to fulfill his plan to bring salvation even for them. Even for them. So we've got... Say also that he used that to convict them. 
I'm sorry? Could you also say he used that to convict them? Oh, absolutely. Which is another work of the Holy Spirit. He's, he's going to convict you. And that's what he's doing here. Peter is preaching through the Holy Spirit and convicting these men of the truth about their part in putting to death the Son of God. That's what he's doing. And then he says, you put him to death. But what did God do? He raised him up. And then he quotes what Old Testament prophet? We don't think of David much as a prophet, do we? But he was very prophetic. God gave him a lot of words of prophecy. And this focal prophecy was from David and it's all about God raising up one to sit on his throne and how David said you're not going to suffer uh, me to stay in Hades and you won't let your holy one see what corruption what's what's that mean was David's body corrupted when Peter preached that yes it was that's the point that Peter makes David's tomb is still with us his body's in that tomb but where's Jesus David was preaching to us about Jesus, how his body would not see corruption, and God has raised him from the dead. That's Peter's message, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So he, he finishes that message, stating again, as Preston pointed out from Hebrews, that he'd raised him to, to the right hand of God. And what's their response in verse 37? Verse 37. So did they believe Peter? They believed it. At least some of them did. The, the text doesn't talk about those who did not. It talks about those who did believe. Billy? predetermined plan of God. You're gonna, it's going to happen. It's happened. The Holy Spirit's telling you about it. I'm preaching about it, and now you're going to be convicted of it. Right. And how often, I have to wonder... Uh, have I fought against the predetermined plan of God? He's working something in my life, but I don't like the way he's going about it. It's either taken too long or it's taken me on a path I don't want to go down, and uh, I don't care much for it. And so what do you do at a time like that? You better talk to the Lord about it, Preston. Paul was on his way to arrest because he had a letter saying he could rest any of the believers, and then Jesus appeared to him. It says, hard for thee, and I don't want to take this out of context, it says, hard, hard for thee to kick against the pricks. In other words, he's seeing that these people believe a certain way, but yet he is convinced in his mind that they're wrong. But then maybe there's something that, well, I don't know. I've always struggled with that comment there, and I'm wondering if that applies, if that's the same type of thing when you say, uh, God's predetermined plan, although it's going to work out, but sometimes it's hard for me to take it, you know what I'm saying? I don't know if that's the same uh, translation or the same way to look at it as what you just mentioned. Well, I, I do know this. If I was back there, and, and I'm standing by the road as Paul goes by on his way to Damascus with his entourage, and he's got letters in his hand from the chief priests and the elders to persecute the Christians in Damascus, I would not be thinking to myself, there's a guy that needs to hear the gospel. But that's what God knew. This, this is the guy. And so many times my judgment gets in the way of spreading the message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I, I'm either afraid or I don't think it's the right time or I don't think that person's uh, right for it or ready for it. But if, if we would just Go about the business of talking to people about Jesus at every opportunity we had. I just wonder how the church would grow. I try to do that. And a lot of times I get shot down. That's okay. Uh, how many times did Babe Ruth strike out? A lot. Uh, when I first read, I can't remember the statistic. I need to write it down in the back page of my Bible. It was, it was an unreal amount of times that Babe Ruth struck out. But you don't remember Babe Ruth as the strikeout king, do you? He was the home run king. What about Abraham Lincoln? You ever read much about his political uh, career prior to him becoming president? He was the biggest loser you could imagine. 
uh, all kinds of things he got into, they just failed. They didn't work out. It wasn't his fault necessarily. I, I, I don't know that there's a one of those things that happened to him that you would say, well, that's his fault. But he still had a lot of failure until he became president. And if somebody were to ask you, who's, who's your favorite president of all time? How many of us would say, well, it's got to be Abe Lincoln. Got to be Abe. And today, there are some people who are tearing down his statue because they think he was a racist. Now, if you think things in this world can't get twisted around crazy, this is where that happens. Is that the second bell? <laughs> Just keep pushing that button. I, I appreciate your patience this morning. Uh, Lord willing, we'll come back to this. We'll come back and we'll start in verse 37 and move on from there. That's, that's the plan.